Hello and welcome to this edition of Japan Today. I'm Karuna Shinsho. Nearly 40 people were killed when a pyroclastic flow of volcanic ash, superheated lava and molten rock occurred on the eastern slopes of Mount Unzen in Nagasaki Prefecture on June 3rd. Mount Unzen first erupted last November after 200 years of dormancy. Recent volcanic activity has been going on since late May. Pyroclastic flows are phenomena in which volcanic lava and molten rock fall down the slopes of a volcano while emitting a column of superheated gas and smoke. They're considered one of the most dangerous phenomena produced by volcanoes. On the afternoon of June the 3rd, a pyroclastic flow occurred on the eastern slopes of Mount Unzen, reaching the river Mizunashi, which runs through Shimabara City at the foot of the volcano. Many journalists and firemen were trapped in the pyroclastic flow. Some sustained serious burns from the superheated gas and were taken to nearby hospitals for treatment. On June 4th, the day after the pyroclastic flow, Self-Defense Force armored vehicles were sent to the area to look for the missing. On the night of June the 8th, Mount Unzen erupted again, and there was another large-scale pyroclastic flow. It burned trees and fields by the Mizunashi River, and an extensive area of Shimabara was also damaged. The flow also destroyed 73 homes and warehouses. About 3,000 residents of Shimabara area were ordered to evacuate from their homes. Since then, they've been leading inconvenient lives in school gymnasiums, public community halls, and makeshift houses. Mount Unzen erupted last November for the first time since 1792. According to the records, three months after the eruption in 1792, a powerful earthquake and its tsunami hit Shimabara City, and as many as 15,000 locals perished. Because of the unprecedentedly large number of dead, the disaster was called the Shimabara upheaval. Because there are indications that Mount Unzen will erupt again and produce more pyroclastic flows, volcanologists are urging the people of Shimabara and the city authorities to take careful precautions. Among the victims of the disaster on June the 3rd were three non-Japanese, Maurice and Katya Kraft, a French couple, both well-known volcanologists, and American scientist Harry Glicken. The two French scientists observed more than 200 volcanoes over the past 20 years and arrived in Unzen right after the first pyroclastic flow occurred. The American scientist, who was a visiting researcher at a Japanese university, came to Unzen with the crafts, and all three were killed while observing the volcanic activity. After learning about their deaths, a number of Japanese scientists who were friends of the crafts held a service in Shimabara to mourn them. This is some of the footage which the crafts taped just before their death. It shows just how powerful the pyroclastic flow was and shows us that the power of the flow is quite beyond our experience. The flow claimed many precious human lives, including those of the crafts. At the expense of their lives, the crafts have told us what tremendous power nature has. A team of Japanese scientists is now campaigning for a Japanese version of the videotape left by the crafts in order to help prevent volcanic disasters in the future. Nagano City has reason to rejoice. The city, located in central Japan, has been chosen by the International Olympic Committee to host the Winter Olympic Games in 1998. Winter Olympic Games 1998. And now I would like to to announce the winner, the city of Nagano. <laughs> I can't find any words to express my joy. My dream of many years has finally come true. I hope that this will help the city of Nagano develop. 
I hope I can live long enough to watch this world sports event. During the 16-day Winter Olympics, 57 competitions in six events will be held in special facilities in Nagano City, Shiga Heights, and the village of Hakuba, near the northern Japan Alps. In Nagano, the main hall will be built for skating competitions, including ice hockey and figure skating. The main hall will be a dome structure with a huge ring for speed skating. Its capacity will be up to 10,000, one of the world's biggest. Near the main hall, an athlete's village accommodating about 3,000 people and a press center will also be built. Five courses for alpine skiing competitions will be built in Shiga Heights, the leading ski resort area in Japan. One for women's downhill events will slope at an angle of nearly 59 degrees and will be about 2,500 meters or about one and a half miles long. In the village of Hakuba, two ski jump ramps for 90 and 70 meter events will be built side by side. In addition, biathlon and cross-country courses will also be built. All the facilities will be within about 40 kilometers or 24 miles of the athlete's village. Because Nagano is famous for its rich wildlife and scenic beauty, the organizers are concentrating on how to harmonize the high technology being used to build the new structures with the natural environment. A United Nations conference on disarmament was held in Kyoto in late May, and some 100 arms experts from across the world converged to discuss effective means of promoting arms reduction. Prime Minister Toshiki Kaifu, in a keynote speech, said some of the world's leading nations were partly responsible for the Gulf War because their weapons exports to Iraq had enabled Baghdad to become a military power. Kaifu said Japan intends to present to the General Assembly of the United Nations this fall a plan to require all UN member nations to report to the world body on its imports and exports of weapons. Some 100 arms experts from 37 countries discussed the current regulations on arms trade and ways to promote inspections of nuclear facilities. A flotilla of maritime self-defense force minesweepers has been operating in the Persian Gulf since June 5th, aiming to clear mines planted in the Gulf by Iraqi troops during the Gulf War. Here's a look at how they're faring. The MSDF minesweepers are operating in waters some 100 kilometers or 62 miles east of Kuwait. Crew members aboard the vessels must wear masks and goggles in order to protect their eyes and throats from the soot produced by burning Kuwaiti oil wells and from desert sand. As of mid-June, an estimated 200 mines were still unaccounted for. This is equal to one-sixth of the total number of mines planted by Iraqi troops during the war. The MSDF believes that its sweeping operations will continue at least until the end of August. In other international cooperation, the government has extended emergency aid as well as financial assistance to Bangladesh, which was devastated by a powerful cyclone at the end of April. The disaster reportedly killed over 100,000 local people and dealt a serious blow to the region along the Bay of Bengal. To meet a request from Bangladesh, Japan dispatched an international emergency relief operation unit to the disaster-stricken country. The unit comprised 50 Japanese rescuers and two of Japan's largest helicopters, the largest scale ever. Tokyo has also offered food, medical supplies, water purifier equipment, and other emergency goods worth some 20 million U.S. dollars, as well as financial aid. Japan has also expressed its intention to extend to Bangladesh some $90 million worth of commodity loans. Also, some $20 million from funds Japan has allocated for World Bank use will be used to help reconstruct the cyclone-hit country. And now for topics from all over Japan. First, here's a story about black swans and carp who are good friends. The Kamikawa Dam in Hondo City in Kumamoto Prefecture is designed to prevent floods. Asae Shimazaki has been feeding the carp here for the past 10 years. 
Whenever the black swans see Shimazaki feeding the carp, they come towards her as well. This is how the black swans became friends with the carp. Whenever Shimazaki feeds the black swans, the hungry carp approach the shores. But the black swans never harass the carp. The Kyoto bus driver is now preparing to scale Mount Kilimanjaro, the highest mountain in Africa, on steel stilts, possibly in mid-June. Seichi Hirasawa began climbing mountains on steel stilts 13 years ago. One stilt weighs about 5 kilograms, or approximately 11 pounds. Hirasawa thought that this kind of climbing would help increase his physical strength and concentration while he was enjoying mountaineering. He has already climbed many high mountains in Japan, including Mount Fuji, the highest. Since he decided to climb Mount Kilimanjaro, which is 5,895 meters, or about 18,000 feet high, Hirosawa has been training on Mount Atago in a Kyoto suburb. Hirosawa hopes to scale Kilimanjaro before the end of the month of June if all goes well. Now he will take a pair of aluminum stilts to Africa along with his steel ones. Egyptian peas, about 3,300 years old, are flourishing in the backyard of a woman who lives in Shimonoseki in Yamaguchi Prefecture. The peas were discovered in the tomb of Tutankhamun in Egypt at the beginning of the century. Hisako Setoguchi, who lives in Shimonoseki, received three of them from an acquaintance in 1989 and planted them in her garden. Last year, she picked 300 peas. This year, the stalks have grown to more than 150 centimeters, or about 60 inches, and are bearing even more peas than last year. Set to Gucci says she will give some of the seeds to those interested in this special pea. Guess how this drum is different from ordinary drums. Ordinary drums are usually made of Zalkova wood, but this drum is made of ceramics. According to a drum maker, a ceramic drum costs only half what an ordinary Zalkova drum costs. What about the sound? Is it different from that of ordinary drums? Almost the same. Well, strictly speaking, there may be some differences in the sound quality because the material is different, but I cannot detect it. Although ceramic drums are economical, there is a problem. They are heavier than wooden drums. A future task for the makers is to develop a thinner and lighter ceramic drum without changing the sound quality. In Niigata Prefecture, which is famous for its tulip cultivation, they're developing ways to make dyes from the flowers. The tulips are usually picked immediately after they reach full bloom. This method of cultivation improves the quality of the tulip bulbs. To make the best use of the tulips while they're in full bloom, the flower growers came up with an idea, making natural dyes from the blooms. The tulip petals are first sun-dried and then boiled in a solution that contains some dye stuffs. The boiled petals are then processed with special chemicals. The whole process sounds very simple, but some problems still remain to be solved before full-scale commercialization can begin. Among the tasks tulip growers have to tackle is how to keep the vivid colors even in the sun and how to reduce their production costs. Despite that, it will not take too long before natural dyes made from the tulips are put on the market. In Japan, the rainy season started in June nationwide. During the rainy season, a rain front remains almost stationary to the south of Japan. In Tokyo, there was little rain at the beginning of the season, but it rained substantially at the end of June. In Itako, in Ibaraki Prefecture, a bride passed by boat through waterways full of irises in a traditional style wedding. Every time it rains, the hydrangeas become more and more colorful. The rainy season will end in about mid-July and will be followed by the hot and humid summer. Next, technological trends in Japan. Eggs sold in most Japanese supermarkets are usually sorted into three sizes, large, medium, and small. But the difference in size is only 6 grams, so separating eggs manually can be difficult. But now, an egg sorting machine is changing all that. This is a company that makes the egg sorting machine. It has a 70% share of the market. The machine is now in use. The eggs are brushed before being lined up. Then 
Then the eggs roll onto guides which turn them around and again line them up in the same way. The weight is checked by a sensor. It takes only a tenth of a second to weigh each egg. This type of sensor is used in aircraft and satellites requiring high technology equipment. This egg sorting machine maker is said to be the first Japanese company to use the sensor to sort eggs. The error in weighing is said to be a tenth of a gram. The weight of each egg is memorized by computer and the egg sorted by weight. Can you guess why the eggs don't break when they drop from the conveyors? The answer is simple. The holder that catches the eggs is made of very smooth nylon resin. A balance is attached to the other side of the holder and a pair of holders receives the eggs. The holders open a little as soon as an egg falls into them, thus receiving it softly by absorbing the shock. The holders can receive eggs unbroken even if they drop from 50 centimeters or 20 inches. Thanks to this innovation, 50,000 eggs can be sorted by a person in a day, compared with only 4,000 manually. Aramid may not be a familiar name, but researchers are focusing on it as a fiber of the future. A leading textile company which developed the fiber says it is stronger than iron and resistant both to heat and chemicals. This is a new fiber called Aramid, which is made from oil. Several aramid fibers are combined to be processed into a bundle. The bundle is said to be seven or eight times as strong as iron. A leading construction company is now testing ways of using aramid fibers in civil engineering. The company collects data by using aramid fibers in place of steel, comparing their different properties. The aramid fiber was developed in a plant of a leading textile company in Matsuyama City in Ehime Prefecture. According to the company, the new fiber has already been used in firemen's gloves. To improve the quality of the fiber, the developer is testing it in a laboratory. This is one such experiment. In order to see how much stronger aramid fiber gloves are than ordinary cotton gloves, the temperature is raised to about 300 degrees Celsius, or 572 degrees Fahrenheit. The cotton gloves are charred, but the aramid gloves were unchanged. When the two gloves were dipped into a solution containing 20% sodium hydroxide, the aramid gloves were unchanged, but the cotton gloves discolored and disintegrated. At present, there are only three companies in the world which are making aramid fibers. Ours is one of the three. We are testing to try to improve the quality of aramid fiber so that it's capable of replacing steel. Turning to another type of fiber, here's a report on how optical fibers are being used for fire prevention. This is the inside of a tunnel on the Shuto Expressway in Tokyo, in which an optical fiber thermometer is being used experimentally. We can read the temperature inside the tunnel using the optical fibers, and if a fire were to break out, it could be followed on the screen. The temperature is measured by laser beams passing through the optical fibers. The fibers are a thousand meters, or 0.62 of a mile long. Let's measure the temperatures of two water samples. The hot water is at 60 degrees Celsius. The ice water is at 10 degrees Celsius. There's a loop about 180 meters from one end of the optical fiber and another about 230 meters from the other end. The left-hand loop will be soaked in the ice water, the right-hand loop in the hot water. The reading shows that the right-hand loop is at about 60 degrees, and the left-hand loop is at about 10. The laser beam passes through the optical fiber, reflecting backward and forward. After the laser beam hits the molecules of glass, it is reflected and returns but optical fibers are more transparent at higher temperatures, which is why there are more beams. 
By figuring out how much time elapses during the reflections, we can find out how far away the reflection is taking place as well as the temperature. Here is an office building in Tokyo in which the internal temperature is measured by an optical fiber thermometer to prevent computer transformers from overheating. The Fire Prevention Center monitors the temperature of the transformers detected by the optical fibers. The peak indicates the temperature of the transformers. The highest temperature is about 70 degrees Celsius. If it should reach 110 degrees, an alarm would be activated. Next sports, we bring you two reports. In the last Grand Sumo Tournament in Ryogoku in Tokyo, Yokozuna Grand Champion Asahi Fuji beat Ozeki Champion Konishiki on the very last day and won the tournament. Here's more. Up to the 14th day, Konishiki was very confident winning every bout. Yokozuna Asahi Fuji was one step behind Konishiki with one loss by the 14th day, and he met Konishiki on the very last day of the tournament. Konishiki will capture the Emperor's Cup for his second time in a small career. Out and go, now Konishiki quickly gets the bell grip, but Yokozuna is in a good position. Moves warm with all his power, and Konishiki goes out of the race. Konishiki lost to Asahi Fuji and Asahi Fuji. Asahi Fuji won and they had a playoff. So, if Konishiki wins over Asahi Fuji in this bout, he will capture them for a cup. Now, Yokozuna sidestepped and quickly gets the bounce break of Konishiki. And Yokozuna Asahi Fuji maintains his low position against the chest of Konishiki. It's Yokozuna's movement. Now, Yokozuna follows Konishiki off balance and the huge body of Konishiki rolls over the surface of the, the whole ring. Asaki would have to capture the Emperor's Cup for the fourth time in the season. Asaki would show his power as Yokozuna Grand Champion and won the tournament. It was his fourth tournament of victory. Despite his defeat by Asahi Fuji in the final bout, Konishiki was highly praised for his record in the tournament. During the 8th Asian Women's Soccer Tournament in Fukuoka recently, Japan won the right to take part in the World Tournament. Japan finished second after China. The Japanese team sailed into the semi-finals, where it met up with stiff opposition from Taiwan. When Japanese players attempted to pass off, they were blocked by the Taiwanese defenders. Neither team scored, pushing the game into a 20-minute overtime period. Both teams were unable to score, and the game was then decided by a penalty kick competition. All the four players from both teams shot successfully. The Japanese veteran goalkeeper Masai Suzuki blocked the fifth penalty kick by Taiwan. Japan's Mayumi Kaji then kicked toward the left-hand corner for the game-winning tally, giving Japan the right to compete in the world tournament. The Japanese women's soccer team will take part in the World Tournament in Beijing in November. In our feature story, we introduce a rural musical called The Labor of Love, which has been a box office hit in Japan. This musical is a joint Japanese-American production. As fierce debate about problems like the opening of the rice market continues in real life, Labor of Love is about how Japanese and American farmers try to communicate and understand each other. Michio Ishida has more. What happened in Detroit? 
Thousands of people lost the Japanese auto industry and ruined Detroit. Thousands of people lost their jobs uh, over there in Michigan too. Yeah, yeah, Japan wanted to buy some of our rice for over there. Well, that's good too. Huh? Yeah. Japan. Yeah, yeah, so Last moment preparations are taking place for this agricultural musical. Some 80 members from the American and Japanese theatrical groups are taking off from this rural part of Japan for their series of performances. The setting is Louisiana, a major U.S. rice growing area. A young Japanese is staying with a farmer's family in Louisiana. For some reason, the man's parents in Japan think that their son is getting married to the daughter of his host family, and they have come all the way to find out. The two families start discussing the relationship of their children, and their talk develops into an argument between Japan and the United States. In the end, both families experience different agricultural methods and realize that they both love growing rice. Can no proposal come? The two youngsters no, 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 fall no, 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 in love. Oh, no. Just a minute. Uh, wasn't it difficult to take up this kind of topic? Well, it is, I think. I don't know. I mean, I'm really not the expert, but there's a lot of animosity in the States right now, a lot of misunderstandings. Um, you need to approach, approach the issues. We're not trying to solve problems here. No. We're not trying to go away and say this is the solution. But I think when you put a subject out on the table and hopefully are entertained or laugh as you discuss the topic, the people going away from it will start to think about it. A stage hand brings placards in between the scenes to give the Japanese audience a chance to understand what's going on. For the actors, every moment is a fight with a foreign language. Americans are always eager to get as much done in a day as possible. They have so much energy, I can learn a lot from them. Well, I have my uh, dictionary right here. Um, we spend a lot of time going, just a minute, and going like this and pointing to the word we want. We've, there's a point where we, we sort of have a joke around the cast where it's like you get to a certain point and you just have to look at each other and go, because you can't get past that. Um, you know, you can ask each other what you like, whether you like to dance, whether you like to, but you, to get more complicated is very frustrating. There's a lot of love between us, but I don't know how much we really know about each other you know, on some level. This U.S.-Japan joint troop is scheduled to visit eight different prefectures in Japan. And then from the end of August, they're scheduled to travel all around the United States. I certainly hope their musical will promote friendly relations between Japan and the United States through their entertaining performances. Michio Ishida reporting. We hope you enjoyed this edition of Japan Today. Until our next edition, I'm Corona Shinsho saying sayonara. This program has been brought to you by a worldwide contractor, Hazamagumi Corporation, NTT and an international group, Yauha.